use uh, the Arduino. The recording is on. Yeah, I, I finally got around to reading his article the other day there. That was quite interesting. And he said he threw it together over a period of two days. Man, oh, man, he can work fast, that guy. Is that the one that's going on in uh, the uh, software uh, IO group? I don't know. No, oh, this is Farhan doing the uh, going all strictly analog. Oh, okay. The only thing that's remotely uh, not would be he's using a frequency counter to do a readout, but otherwise it's all analog. There's no Arduino or anything like that. Yeah. Was that Dwayne? Was that the? Uh, did he did he give that talk at uh, F F E I M about that uh, radio? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It's uh, it was at F E I M. If you want, I think I still got a copy of the uh, of, of his presentation that I uh, recorded during the uh, during F T I M. I can post it if you want. Yeah, that's okay. I was there. No, because. Uh, the interesting thing was, Dwayne, that uh, he gave that presentation and nobody asked a question. Nobody. Like uh, when Hans Summer spoke, everyone was just clawing to get questions in. And when Jack spoke about his, his radio, you know, they, they had to basically cut off and say, that's it. Enough. We have to move on. But when Farhan spoke, not one person asked the question. That was, that was strange. Actually, I found what he's doing for his mixer circuit quite interesting. Hey, hey, Bob. Hey. Hey, Bob. Hey, hey Don. I can't seem to get in with my Mac. Oh, this is a PC world. <laughs> Should have stuck to Windows XP. Well, I have Windows somewhere, but I don't. I don't have Jitsi on on that one. I, I guess I should try it. Hey, hey DOS rules. <laughs> <laughs> I, Jeez, I, I still have, I still have, have no five and a half. I have five and a half floppy with DOS on it somewhere. <laughs> I, still, I, still have, I still have DOS on a floppy. I still have floppies with DOS on it. It just, you know what? I just can't bring myself to to get through it. It just, and I still have the DOS manuals too. I just, it's just something I can't get rid of. You know, well, there'll there'll be something you're gonna want to do after you throw it out. That's gonna say, okay, I wish I had it, and that's why that's why I keep a copy on a disc. Well, I was reading. I was, I was reading a, a library book that I got off uh, off uh, the current our library, and it's one of those spy or those uh, crime novel things, and it's all about murders and whatnot. And and uh, they're using pay phones. They don't have they don't have anything. This book's like ten years old. They don't have pay phones. They don't have anything. Well, they just got pay phones. No cell phones. No nothing. And somebody in somebody has one PC in their office. The whole office has one PC. Yeah. Anyway, if I really want to, I can go up in my garage. I've got a uh, one of our instruments that we had back. Uh, it was when I first started with this company, with that company, and uh, I even have some of the programs on paper tape for it. Oh my mm -hmm. God! I've I've got I have a, a so, spreadsheet. So I, I, I did a spreadsheet, a three dimensional spreadsheet in basic back before you had Lotus and Excel. And I still have my notebook with the everything in it to recreate it in case there's some kind of major crash and I have to recreate programs again. <laughs> yeah, I've been seeing that on uh, YouTube. There's a lot of people building retro computers now. There's a ton of people building old 6502 Z80s. There's even, I saw, there's a guy, uh, he's uh, building a PDP-11. Hmm. There's a uh, company right now that's putting out a little board that has an ESP32 on it. Uh, it's got uh, VGA output. It's got inputs for a mouse and uh, I think it's a PS2 mouse and keyboard. And I think it's about you know, two inches square. And one of the programs that's available for it is... Uh, uh, 
DOS with Windows 3 on it emulated. Oh. And it's about 20 bucks for the whole thing. <laughs> And what's, and what's funny is that ESP32 has got far more processing power than the original uh, DOS, right? The original Intels, what was the 8088s or 286s? Oh, I've, I've, played with, uh, I've played with the ESP32, the uh, original one. It's got uh, dual core 640 meg uh, processors in it. So that's got, you know, comes with four meg of ram and uh i forget how much uh how much memory i mean the first board i ever worked on what i was doing any design on was a, a z80 it was about a foot square cost about well with the assembler and compiler and stuff like that it was about 500 bucks it had a, a four meg z80 uh 4K of RAM and space for uh, up to 24K of ROM. Uh, it had a, ser it had a serial port and the three three uh, uh, parallel ports. So basically, it was a 500-hour uh, Arduino. <laughs> yeah, there was. A, I, did 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 you know, Dwayne, that? Um, they're actually restamping all the Zilog Z80 chips, all the uh, peripheral chips, and they're even uh, making a 6502. They've got a new 6502. It's a 65C02, and with the uh, new Z80 and the new 66502, you could single step it. You don't have to run it like a steady clock. You could pulse the clock and step it and single step it and see what what it's actually doing they're pretty cool chips dave there yeah huh? yeah hi dave i don't see you i do oh thought i said hi is someone saying hi dave yeah bonnie <laughs> oh <hi. laughs> anyways i guess we should get going here uh good evening everybody uh so tonight, I don't know, we got nobody new. Okay. So tonight on the agenda is uh, Michael's going to talk about the uh, nano VNA. Um, then we're going to talk about uh, one weekend at Eric's Farm. Uh, it's going to be starting the uh, 26th, uh, late afternoon, 26th till Sunday. And, uh, and then we can take it from there on uh, projects. Any questions? And that's it. Okay, Michael, if you're ready to roll, you're muted. Where's Michael? Let me see if I can. Michael, you're muted. Okay. There's the nano VNA, at least that's my one. Um, now i got to figure out how to share screens. a long time since I've done this. Okay. <clears throat> Window. There. Share. Okay. Well, that should be the first page, right? Yes, sir. And uh, there's another page? Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Now I can, now I can go and uh, go full screen, I hope. Yeah. Okay. Uh, pointer options. All right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, I bought a Nano H4, Nano VNA H4, a while ago uh, from uh, <clears throat> RNL, RNL Electronic, L R and L Electronics in uh, Ohio, and I've been I've been using it a bit and uh, quite pleased with it. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about what it, the background and all that stuff and how it works and how to use it anyway. So, um, what is it? Uh, well, it's uh, it measures um, magnitude and phase of uh, transmission or reflection characteristics, any any characteristics that you want to use uh, versus frequency, <clears throat> and it does that uh, of a of a device that you device under test, which is the thing you're you're testing. 
On the other hand, a scalar net network analyzer only measures magnitude, like, for example, EMF J259B only measures magnitude. <clears throat> so that's the basic difference. <clears throat> so the scalar, um, it measures signal amplitude only of versus frequency <clears throat> of whatever test, whatever you're testing. And there's different ones out there. <clears throat> the MFJ 259B is between four and 500. I think that's a US price. It might be a Canadian price. I'm not sure. There's those Fox Delta kits around $75. There's the Park Scalar Network Analyzer, which I think was around 100 built as a, as a uh, builders on thing. <clears throat> on the other hand, there's the vector net network analyzers. Excuse me, I have a, I kind of frog in my throat here. And it, <clears throat> it allows you to measure amplitude and phase of whatever you're testing. Um, and you put it, you put your device under test. <clears throat> There's the mini DNA that we in the Mississauga Club, a bunch of us bought, it got to be almost 10 years ago now, it was around $500 <clears throat> US. The nano DNA, last time I looked, was 120, 120 US per RNL. <clears throat> and then you can get to the real DNAs, <clears throat> which are the uh, Agilent, Roden, Swartz, and whatnot. <clears throat> Those guys, anywhere from $5,000, $10,000, $40,000, you know. So um, the uh, nano DNA is a real, a real attractive device to use. So um, there's the nano on the left here. Um, this is the mini VNA. It's a bit smaller, um, about two thirds the size, I think. Rig expert, around $500 plus, and these other ones that, these uh, real ones that are enormously expensive. So having the nano, and for that matter, the mini VNA available to amateurs is really good because it allows you to do stuff. There's no way you could afford to do otherwise. So yeah, some terminology. Device under test is pretty obvious. It's the thing you're testing. It's whatever you connect to your, uh, to your network analyzer. Uh, when you connect it to the nano VNA, for example, it affects the input of the source. Like it, 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 it affects things that you, the, the, um, the the network analyzer as well allows you to measure all kinds of stuff: uh, filter characteristics, amplifier gains, antenna SWRs, um, reflection and transmission characteristics. Allows you to tell you tell how long a cable is if you know the velocity factor. You can use it to find where a fault in a cable is, and and so on and so on. Um, <clears throat> so that's a device under test. S parameters are what the VNAs use. I'll get to that. Um, like I said, you can measure vo uh, voltage uh, standing wave ratio, return loss, all kinds of stuff. And just at the bottom here, <clears throat> phase is really the time delay between one signal and another. I don't know if you can see this, the two time signals in there, two signals in there. <clears throat> so a little bit about how it works. The, 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 the light analogy is you put a, you put a, an instant, let's say this is a lens or something. You put a, you put instant light into it. You get some reflected off the, off the surface, going back to the source in the terminology, and some of it, hopefully most of it, gets transmitted through. Um, the comparison with the, uh, the RF equivalent is the is is the. <clears throat> Nano VNA is on this side. The signal comes in. Some of it gets reflected back. The rest of it goes through, and you, you can measure it. So, a bit more detail. <clears throat> when you go to you calculate things, the the incident wave is called the R. The reflected is A, and the transmitted is B. What's coming out is B. So when you're looking at <clears throat> when you're looking at reflection characteristics, basically what you do is you divide the reflected quantity by the incident quantity in one way or another, and you get <clears throat> SWRs or you get the S11 um, S parameters on the input, and you do the same thing on the output, you'd get the S22 um, reflection coefficients. You can measure admittance and impedance and return loss and whatnot. On the transmission side over here, basically you measure the, the output 
in relation to the input, the incident, the, the transmitted in relation to the uh, incident wave. And you can do all kinds of calculations as well with that. So, <clears throat> by the way, a lot of these slides have been uh, shamelessly borrowed from uh, Al Wolke and company and a few other places. This is what scattered parameters are about. They're means of characterizing what you're looking at. And basically, it's it's the ratio of uh, a response to a signal to the stimulus. So, uh, S X Y is the ratio, the response at port X, whatever that happens to be, resulting from the stimulus applied to port Y. So S11 would be looking at the reflection at a port. It would be what's S, <clears throat> the response at port 1 to what's coming in at port 1. And S21, the transmission characteristic, is uh, the response at port 2 to the signal coming in at port one. That's why it's S21. And you can see the various quantities here on the device under test. So in practice, these things, the, the uh, S11 is the forward reflection, reflection coefficient, SWR for an antenna, for example. The forward transmission characteristic is what's going through the device, the loss for a filter, insertion loss for a filter if that's your device under test or the gain of an amplifier. And there's various other ones. And they're complex numbers and uh, they're often referred to as log magnitude, which is the log, 10 times the log of the magnitude of whatever it is. And the nano VNA can display linear characteristics like real and imaginary parts or log magnitude forms. Uh, the nano DNA does not do the reverse thing, like it won't, you, you can only look at transmission one way, you can't look at reflections from the output going back through the device unless you turn it around or something. So inside it, um, you've got the source here, which is the, the, um, the nano DNA, all of them have a, an internal source, uh, nano DNA is, uh, couple hundred milliwatt of volts um, square wave. And uh, <clears throat> that goes into your device under test. You get the inf inc instant signal going in, you get the reflected signal coming back. Those are taken off the input port and put into a separation device here. And what this does is separate out the incident wave or the incident signal from what's being reflected back. And likewise on the output, the other side of the device, same idea, it takes, uh, it looks at what's coming through and basically those, those outputs are fed to a receiver and a detector and then a processor and then they're displayed on a screen of some kind. So in terms of how these signals are separated on the, on the input, you can, there's a number of different ways of doing it. One is just a signal splitter device. The other is a directional coupler where you get the signal coming through and you get, um, it's coupled into the, it's directional. So you just get part of it coupled into the device. What's coming in and likewise, what's being reflected back, it gets taken off and, and fed into the, uh, the computation side of things. The other thing is a bridge, which the nano VNA uses. Um, these are 50 ohms, I think. And, uh, this is your test. This is a, this is this would be port one and port two. Let's say input and output port on a on a nano and the detectors inside. So there's different models of the nano VNA out there. The original one was the H, the just called the H version, and it was it was um, a 2.8 inch screen. I uh, used SMA connectors. Um, then there's the H4, which I have, which is a bigger screen, four inch screen, also SMA connectors. It's good up to 900 megahertz. There's an F model out there, which is a four inch display. And it, I think the F has a slightly, has a higher frequency rate limit. There's a V2 out there, which is one of the newer ones, uh, limits between three and four gigahertz, quite a, quite a big difference. Some of them have end connectors. Some of them also have cases. Some of the cases are metal. Um, different ones. And um, 
there's a lot of stuff out there. You go on Amazon and there's, there's zillions of um, clones out there. And you're best to get a what you get what you know you're getting. That's why I suggest R and L Electronics. That's where I got mine, and Al Wilkie recommended it, and a lot of people get it there. Very happy with it. Current price when I last checked was $100, 120 US. Um, no shipping to Canada though, so you've got to. Uh, they won't they won't mail it to Canada or ship it anyway. They just won't do it. So what you have to do is use something like cross border pickups, where you get a, a um, post office box it's in Niagara Falls and basically they ship to Niagara Falls your your box number at Niagara Falls cross border calls you or emails you and says we got this this thing how much does it cost what is it you tell them that by email you then you you um, they tell you the the amount you owe them which is their shipping charge from Niagara Falls to Toronto a Mississauga actually and you can also have stuff mailed to you. If you don't live in Mississauga, you have it mailed to you as well. Anyway, I used a lot. It's very good. Um, the other thing that's worthwhile doing is um, putting a little extender um, devices on the uh, adapters on the on the um, the thing itself, the nano VNA itself. Either do that or, or use the cables. It comes with a bunch of cables. Um, uh, they're RG-174 uh, or 136 or something, small cables anyway. The idea is to protect the uh, protect the connection of the SMA connector on the nano to the PC board. So uh, just to do that, and uh, you compensate for when you when you calibrate them, you compensate for the particular way you've done. So here's the H4. Uh, this is mine. Uh, over here, this is the extender. It just, uh, it's just it's a male male connector on one end, a female on the other, and you just screw them on, and Bob's your uncle. And there's a guy on the web that, believe it or not, recommends using a torque wrench to put things like this on, and a torque wrench to put cables on, and that's going a bit far, I think. But anyway. So let's see, this is the display. The start and stop frequencies are at the bottom. This is uh, 13.95 to 14.05. I guess I was looking at the filter or something. I don't know. Up here, there's this is S11, which is the reflection coefficient. Uh, and um, S1, this is, for the, this is for reflection. This is, this, this is a Smith chart here. Uh, the log magnitude output uh, transmission functions here. They're not showing on this chart right now. It comes with, you can select the Smith chart. Um, you can check and make sure that things are calibrated properly by where the, where the um, starting points are. Um, the calibration number over here, you can save calibrations here. This is C0, I mean, it's in slot zero. Yeah. And down here is the number of ports that it uses to calibrate. That's, sorry, number of points it's used to do the calibration. On the side of the H4, anyway, it's got a USB-C C port, which is uh, to connect to the software and also to charge it. Um, it's got a charging light as well. Some a little light right here, I think it is, tells you when it's charging. It's got a little rotary wheel, which you can turn left or right or press. Um, to do various things. It's got a system LED and the, the battery LED. Yeah. Oh, this is a rather intimidating menu structure map that I got off. This is for the, the latest version of firmware, I think. Uh, it looks really bad, but basically this is, when you turn it on, you get a, you get a, a home menu. That's this here. You get these things on here. Um, if you click on the display function, you get these guys here. If you click on the calibrate function, you get a whole bunch of stuff here and you can work your way down. You go here and then you go to calibrate, then you go down and you've got your calibration points and then you save the outputs. Um, over here are the traces. There's a whole bunch of traces you can set up. Uh, practically speaking, it seems three or four is at most you want to use. Uh, what else? The format thing, log magnitude phase, whether it's a Smith chart you're looking at, whatever, it's all here. Far more on this than, and this is the frequency setting thing. It's done through the uh, 
through um, the stimulus thing over here. Stimulus somehow, anyway. That, yeah. Anyway, that, so you've got all kinds of stuff you can do. A lot more than you really need to do. So basically how you use it is you, you start out, you sort of know what you want to do. So you, you select the frequency range you want to do, look at um, using the stimulus function. Then you calibrate it. You save the calibration. You set up the channels and the markers and all that stuff, depending on what you want to do. And then away you go. So if you want to set the frequency range to start with, you come to your home menu and you go to the stimulus tab on it. And, and by the way, it comes with a little uh, guitar um, picks that you can use to sort of tap the screen. This is all touch screen stuff, very handy to use. Anyway, so in the stimulus thing, you've got a start and a stop. You can go start, start frequency, stop frequency. You can go to the center and enter the span, all kinds of stuff. One of the things you can do that I discovered recently is you can if you hit this CW frequency thing, it, set, it puts out a fixed signal. If you set a start and stop, it sweeps all the time. And you can see that on the oscilloscope. But if you set, you set up this CW frequency tab, it's it, it set up for 7.2 megahertz and, and it just stays there. So when you, and when you push these things, you get a little a keypad here. You want to put 7.2 megahertz, you go 7.2 and capital M for megahertz. And then that's that's how you do it. Pretty easy. So you have to calibrate these things, and the reason for that is to uh, to account for internal mismatches and issues inside the the nano VNA. It allows you to establish a what's called the me measurement plane, which could be the, it should be the terminals of the device you're testing, like the filter. So you should calibrate it at the connection to the filter, not not at the output of the nano VNA itself, because that, so you, can't, you, you account for the cable that way. So uh, it allows you to eliminate errors introduced by cables, connectors, whatever you've got. And whenever you change the frequency range you should do a new calibration. And the nano, the, the uh, H4 anyway, um, the, the, original H, the original H only did 101 points, calibration points. And if you think about that over a long, well, down the bottom here, if, it, if it's 100 points, um, if the frequency range you're dealing with is 900 megahertz, you, it's one point every, every nine, calibration point every nine megahertz, which means if you try to use it on let's say the 20 meter band, like it's not, you're going to miss the, uh, the calibration points. They're not going to fall where you want them. So you have to be, be aware of that. So what you do is you calibrate it over the frequency range you're going to actually be looking at. And you use a large number of points, and that way you get reasonable accuracy. So yeah. So how you do it, uh, again, you go to this, um, this home page here, and you hit the calibration tab takes you to calibrate. Then you got some choices. And, and these little SOLT devices, it comes with these. Um, one of them is an open circuit. That would be that one, I think. So it's just open. There's no pin inside. The other one is a short. Next one is a short circuit. So it's, it's, it, the pin is shorted. Um, then there's a load. That's this, I think. That's the load, 50 ohm load. And then there's this through connector, just a female to female connector. So basically, what you do is you um, you put the uh, the open connector on, and you hit open, and it thinks for a bit, and then it basically says, "Okay, I'm done that." Then then you go to the short, you change the uh, little connector, you go to the short. Likewise, the load, and then there's another thing called isolation, which you put the load on the output of the on the you put it on the the load terminal, the the second terminal of the VNA. And then there's this through connector. Basically, you take this thing and connect it with your, a cable to the input and a cable to the output. Once you're done, you hit finish, you hit done, and then you can save it in four different places. And when you turn the thing and then you go done, it takes you back to the main menu. When you do, when you calibrate it, it saves the calibration, saves whatever calibrations you put in there. You can put it four in there, it will save all four. 
So you turn it off, turn it off, you can go back and and pick the one you want. Presuming, of course, you remember what you've done, which I don't. So when it comes to uh, look at what you're doing, uh, the mode and the channel, you go to you go to the display, you pick the format, log magnitude, that's what you want to look at. If it's a Smith chart you want to look at, you click on the Smith chart button. SWR gives you an SWR plot, and there's a few others as well. And you can change the scale of the of the display, and you can also change uh, the reference level because it comes it when you when you start it, it comes with uh, turn it on. The reference level might not be what you want when you're looking at transmission uh, the S21 transmission through. It might be wrong, you might have to adjust it to uh, adjust the level to, to see if it's an amplifier, let's say, to adjust the level to see the gain. Otherwise, it's off It's off the display. Well, you can measure with the signal port. You can, using just the single port, just the output, you, you connect it. It's called, uh, it's the channel one, channel zero, actually. Um, you can, you can measure the SWR, you can measure complex impedance of a transmission line, component values, feed line length, distance to a fault, and all that stuff. If you use both terminals, you can now your device under test, instead of being connected to the output of the nano VNA, it's connected between the output and the input. And then you can measure your filter characteristics, losses, uh, all kinds of stuff. So uh, some examples, you can measure filter. I've already said, talked about it. filter characteristics, SWRs and whatnot. So there's a piece of software. There's a number of pieces of software that come with the Nano. And these are all free. They're available on, uh, on the Groups IO website for the Nano. Um, one of them is called Nano VNA Sabre. There's another one called Nano VNA Sharp and a couple others. These have all been developed by uh, by um, users, and it's all um, it's all open source, so it's all available to look at. So um, you can do with the Nano VNA Saver, you can do much the same kinds of things that you can do with the device itself. You can uh, you can do calibrations. You can also extend the number of points beyond four hundred. It divides the the frequency range you're dealing with into segments, and you can have let's say ten segments, each one with a hundred in it, so you get a thousand points. And you can save the results as IS as uh, JPEGs or PNGs or whatnot, and and print them. So here's an example. What I did, I had a forty meter bandpass filter, actually the uh, the LBS filter from the Let's Build Something project. And basically, I started out and selected the right trace number one, and the format was log magnitude. And because it's a transmission thing, the, you want to use channel two for S21. And uh, then you set your frequency range. I set between six and nine megahertz, calibrate it, and connect the filter between port zero and one to measure the what you're looking at. That's what you got. And, um, so it shows you, there's three markers here. This marker is at the minimum loss, and it's uh, 7.222. Um, M2 down here is the minus 3 dB point. Yeah, I see the, the minimum of the loss is 1.34. This is minus 4.27. And the other point, uh, number three over here on the other side, is minus 4.37 as well. So these are the two 3 dB points even tells you the bandwidth between the two of them. And down the bottom, the frequency, I set it to six megahertz start, nine megahertz stop. And it's got doing 401 points. It's very confusing. Instead of calling this port, port one and port two, they call it channel two and channel one on the H4. And they've got the little arrows to show what you're doing. The other, the more recent ones actually call them channel one and channel two, which is the right way to do it. So well, that's the bandpass filter. And this is what the Nano VNA Saber software looks like when you set it up. 
So up here, you set the start and stop frequencies, same way you did on the device itself. Um, that you, you, you set it up and then we sweep it and you get this characteristic, presuming you've selected that to display off the screen down the bottom, this display setup, you can, you can do a number of different things depending what you want. It also conveniently shows the handbands. This is the blue here is the 40 meter handband. So, um, and the Characteristics are here, the VS is standing wave ratio, return loss, uh, the phases, the gains, and all that stuff are all here. Very handy software. So this is an antenna standing wave SWR curve. Again, I used trace one for the log magnitude format, the channel one for reflection and whatnot, and uh, set the frequency range and did the calibration, which I'll come to in a minute, by the way. And this is for my um, uh, mini quad. Uh, uh, mini, mini, uh, it's, a, it's a small um, three element uh, Yagi. And I looked at 20 meters. And this is what I got. And this is consistent with the mini VNA. And uh, for that matter, uh, you can get these characteristics using an MFJ 259B as well. So here's the curve again, the, the uh, two um, standing, uh, the SWR2 on either side and the minimum down here is 1.41 at 14.176. And at the bottom, you've got the frequency. This is the from 14 to 14.3, the handband. So again, same thing. Um, this time I've got the Smith chart as well. You can display the Smith chart as well. So down here, at uh, the bottom here is, is the minimum SWR. And on the Smith chart, that's, uh, this is the R equals one circle. So this is the 50 ohm circle. So this is outside the 50 ohm circle a bit. This is probably one and two. So it's outside, but you can see on here, you can see that the, uh, the range um, for the two SWR this would be where those points would be here and here. And you can read the characteristics out of here. Um, the R, it would be just above one and the X would be, not sure what that value would be in here, but you can look over here and see that. So the other thing I did just recently, um, I screwed up my courage and, and uh, decided to use this on an amplifier after having looked at Ella Wolke's YouTube video very carefully. Same idea, you set everything up and then uh, you use an attenuator on the output uh, to protect yourself. You want to make sure you don't overload the uh, the output of the nano VNA because the, the VNA is set up to put out about, depends on who you read, minus one, minus two dB or something like that. So the output is set up, expects to see that as well. And if you try to put too much through and without putting a, fil a uh, attenuator, you can have problems. So speaking of output, um, it's a square wave. And depending on who you look at, there's different values. Um, this guy, Avian's blog, talks about 321 millivolts as being the the uh, the value somewhere in 90 to 39 he says it depends on power levels apparently you can change the power levels inside the vna somehow this imsai guy talks about putting out the output of the vna out the is zero at zero dbm al wolke talks about 600 millivolts i measured 362 uh, with a scope so who knows? Um, and like I say, it expects the input to the S21 terminal to be close to the output of the S11. So you have to put an attenuator in. And so I did, this time I used the uh, LBS built booster amplifier and I put a 20 dB attenuator on the output to knock it down. I'm not sure I really needed to do this, but I did it anyway and you calibrate it accordingly. 
you do the calibration at the output of this attenuator. And then it tells you right on the screen right here, it tells you the, uh, the, um, the gain, 14.3 dBm or dB. And this is the curve for the S21 characteristic. So that's the gain over the frequency range from 1 to 30 megahertz, pretty flat. And this is the Smith chart uh, impedance hovering around here. I forgot to talk about calibration here. I'm not sure why I did that, but uh, I meant to talk about calibration, but I didn't. At least I don't have it in the presentation. Okay, so that's um, really all I have to say. So I'll take questions if there are any. I'm going to go back to shop screen, stop sharing the screen. Why didn't that work? There. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, I got a couple of questions. Michael, very good. Very good presentation, by the way. That was excellent. That was very good. You got me. Uh, uh, the hook is <laughs> almost <laughs> set. Okay. So I, you talked about the um, the S22 and S12 parameters, saying that it can't uh, measure that. But I'm having trouble trying to see what that is. Now, is S22, is that like the reflection well, from an old port on the device under test? Or is that a re reflection from the upstream load? If, if I think the way to look at it, if, if it's a filter and you've got the filter between the two terminals, one being the, the nano VNA output, the, and two being the, the other side, what it's receiving, then S12 is what port two is seeing. The output is the out, what the side connected to the output of your filter is seeing given a signal coming in port one. S22 means, as far as I can see, it means what's, it's measuring what gets transmitted, received on port two from a signal coming from port two. Right, right, right. So the, so the nano VNA is the nano VNA is not capable of doing that. A, a ten thousand dollar network analyzer would, but so not, it's, not it's, a nano VNA. It's, it's it's the reflection from the device under test back into the output from the output. So if you've got an output port, right, you send a signal through. Whatever hits that port and gets reflected back, that's what S one two is. Yes, S12 is, is measuring the reflection back no, into the... No, no, S12 is measuring, S12 is the, the signal received on port 2 due to a, a, trans, a stimulus from port 1. So it's measuring what it's seeing on the output of your filter, which is connected to port 2, given a signal coming in at port 1. So it's... Back. Okay, or do you want me to go back? No, so so S, no, you don't have to do that. This is a very simple thing. So S22 minus S21, let's just say it's an absolute value. So S22 is what's coming out, going to back to the to the VNA, right? No. That's what's S, 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 S22. S22 would be... The signal received at port two due to a, a, a signal transmitted at port two. Right. So you don't have that. You don't have that. What you've got yeah, is the, what you've got is the, the, the nano VNA is generating signal on port one and it's going through your filter and being received on port two. Right. So as so, so, so port so S S22, wouldn't that be what's coming out of the device under test and going back into the VNA? It would only be if S22 would be if you if you had a source on the output of the filter, like a generator on the output of the filter, it would be whatever is coming getting going into the the, the filter as a result of a signal being sent 
on the output and being reflected back to the output. So it's kind of like if you if you had an antenna connected to the output of that filter, let's just say, whatever is being reflected back from the antenna is coming back to to the device, and that's what S two 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 is measuring. No, What's, you don't. You don't. Uh, you don't. You would. You, you don't connect the antenna and the filter at the same time. I know. I know. It's a. It's a. It's a hypothetical question. I'm, I'm just trying to understand what signal that output, and if, you know, we, we don't want to get down into the weeds. I'm just trying to understand. I'm, I'm just trying to visualize what that signal coming out and what you're measuring. Like coming in, I get it, no problem. I un understand that uh, uh, completely, but what's coming out, that's where I don't understand. And so that's what I'm trying to uh, understand okay, so if, if it's a filter you're de if it's a filter you're dealing with you've got a, the nano vna is putting a, a signal in one side and is looking to measure the signal on the out on the other side and s21 is the ratio of what is measuring on the output compared to what's going on in the input but an s11 if it's an antenna you put on the input it's the, it's it's the SWR. But there's no yeah. there's no generator inside the nano VNA on connected to port two. There just isn't one. So it's port so S two two and S two one. You're measuring uh, what's being seen on the second on the output port of the filter of yeah. the device. On the list. Yeah, that's you're, right. You're uh, the S the two the two. That's right. The two means it's being on the on it's, the output. That's right. Output, right? Yeah. So so as two one would be what's reflected back. So no, what, no. What's, S two S two S two one is the the magnitude of the signal that's going that's being output from the filter compared to the signal that's going in on the input yeah. side. Okay. Right, so okay. it's, it's yeah. what's it's what's going in, and what's what's not what's coming. Is it what's coming out? Yes, it's what's coming out. It's measuring the transmission characteristic, the lot transmit the loss of the filter. S two one is the loss of the Dwayne, filter. Dwayne is kind of throwing up his hand there. The uh, the thing on the nano VNA compared to other VNAs, the nano VNA has a single directional receiver on the input and a single directional receiver on the output. Uh, other VNAs will have a, on the input, it'll have a receiver that'll go and receive forward and reflected. And on the output, you have another receiver that will receive forward and reflected. That's just a matter of, of you've only got one receiver set that you can use on the nano VNA, right. but other VNAs, you'll have two receivers that you can go and use to do the math on. That's right. That's right. And th those are the expensive ones, Agilent and, and those other ones. But this is very simple. So it's only, it, it's limited. It can't do, it doesn't have receivers on both sides. Yeah. I, I still don't, I like, like, I understand that, but I can't physically understand what the reflection is on port two, you're you're measuring, but that's okay. We spent enough time on this. The let's not uh, let's not dwell on that. I just have one other quick question, um, Michael. Is when you calibrate, do you have to calibrate before each use, or do you calibrate it? You've got a set of cables. You calibrate it, and as long as you're using those cables, you continue to recall that calibration. No, the cali the calibration also has a frequency range associated with it. So like 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 um, the forty meter band, for example. So I would, if I were doing the, uh, a filter on the forty meter band, I would I would set it up with a start frequency that I'm going to actually going to test, like six point nine, stop frequency seven, and that's that's how I I calibrate it with that frequency range, okay, with whatever cables I've got. And if you're if you're smart about this of course when you go back to use it the second time if you've if you've saved the calibration for the 40 meter band use the same cables okay okay but, okay. but, that, but you have but you have to you should really should recalibrate it every time i think especially yeah. okay. if you're doing different frequencies. 
Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at because I just want to know because why would they have it where you save? Because because I, I know I've I've seen other people talk about the VNA and say, oh, you got to calibrate it every, every time you use it. But um, uh, why would they have it so that you could save a calibration? And and it's exactly as you said, if you've got the right parameters, the same sure. parameters you did the prior sweep, you could just recall that and okay. use the same parameters. Of course, the problem is you've got to remember what, like there's four different, S, S true, so S4 or something. So there's four different uh, save uh, calibrations you can use, but you know, I never remember which one, right? You use a couple, you get confused. So you always do it over. It's just easier to do it over. That way you know it's right. Okay, that's good, I'm done, thanks. Uh, somebody else had questions, I think. Uh, Peter's next. Okay, uh, th th thanks for that, uh, Michael. A um, couple of questions here. One is, the first one is the uh, CW frequency. I think you said 7.2 megahertz, but I wasn't sure whether, can you define the frequency or is it fixed at 7.2? Oh, no, you, 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 when, when you calibrate it normally, you, you tell it the start and stop frequency. So you get a range like the 40 meter band or whatever. If you want to just, like for the, for my purposes doing the doing the filter i picked 7.2 it could have been anything it's not oh. it's not in, it's not inherent in the in the nano vna okay so as soon as you hit cw frequency only then then you select the frequency you want that's right okay that's and right. the other one the other question i had was uh you on the uh, screen that it was titled h4 top view you had uh S11 that was in yellow and S11 below it that was in green. What was the difference? What's the difference? Uh, well, what are the, what are the colors to, uh, telling you? Why the different colors? On the top, the top of the thing? Yeah, in the top left hand corner. My photograph of it. Yeah, uh, yes. This. Can you see it? Uh, hang on. Yeah. Okay. Um... It was on, on your slide presentation, the one that had the, the title of the slide was H4 Top View. And on the upper left-hand side of, the, of that screen showed uh, S11 that was in yellow. And then below that was S11 that was in green. I just wondered what's the... Just let me go back and let me go back and have a look here. Can I find it? Let me go have a look here. Um, Peter, I suspect those are... You, you predefine what yellow is going to display and you predefine what green is going to display but that's a guess oh i see you mean it you mean peter you mean in the the press left and right oh that's the top that's oh the top view okay yeah you're looking at you're looking at the display of the of the device and it all depends which trace color you use what what shows up here i chose yellow for s11 and why and is it's there all yellow, yellow marker and then why is it also showing s11 in green because uh, the S11 refers to uh, SW, uh, SWR characteristic, I think, or maybe it was set up wrong, but you wouldn't, normally they'd be different, but one, the green would be the Smith chart and the yellow would be something else. That That's my oh, mistake in okay. setting it up, I think. And the blue, the blue is the through transmission characteristic, the S21 that, that Dave was talking about. Okay, and one last quick one I have here. Uh, you were you were showing the different bands uh, on your screen there in the software, and it was defining in a blue a blue band that was the ham band. Was those yep. something that you defined those? Uh, you can actually. Um, let me go back. You can do that. Um, the the Nano VNA Saver software allows you to do that. It allows you to pick the bands you want. So. If you wanted to do the CB band, or you or you didn't want to show the six meter sixty meter end, which I, I don't have here with the FT one thousand MP, so I took it out. Okay. And when you're looking at a, if you want to look at the a whole HF band, you can you can see all the blue bands being each, okay. each blue being one color, yeah, one band, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Okay. Okay, I think Hassan was next. Go ahead, Hassan. Yeah. Um, Thanks for the presentation. Uh, uh, I didn't pay attention all the way through, so I'm not sure if I should ask had asked this question. But on the front, there's the the two. Uh, I'll have to watch the recording. But on the on the front panel of the thing, it says S11 and then S21. Can you explain what that exactly like? How to interpret? I'm just having trouble mentally mapping that to the S parameters thing. 
Well, there's 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 two there's two channels on the thing. They call it channel one and channel two instead of channel zero and, and channel one instead of channel one and channel two, which would have made it clearer. And and the engraving on it points out that when you when you're looking at because because the the VNA puts the signal out of port zero or channel zero. That's the one where you measure it. So that's why it's there. I'm not sure if that's answered your question. So, so S11 is the uh, reverse, is the reflected on value on port one? S, on S11, you'd measure SWR, for example. So, that, or it would be. It gives you a measure. It gives you it. It basically measures, uh, looks at the input, the output of the VNA itself, and looks at into the device and and the antenna and looks at the received, the reflection coming back. That's what S one one is. It's the ratio of those. Oh, that's, that's, that's all done on port channel zero, the the top one. Okay, so port. Okay, so basically, it's on a four port device. Uh, um, yeah, okay, so the antenna is the device under test, port yes. one, so it's it's transmitting into port one, and the reflected value on that port is S11. Well, S11, S11 is, yes, that's right, yeah, that's, in effect, that's right, yeah. Okay, so these are four, like, unidirectional ports kind of thing. The, the reflections happen on the outside, but inside the dot, they're kind of unidirectional, sort of. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, it's... it's uh, I'm sure the guys who came up with this scheme had a pile of coax cables on their desk and this made perfect sense to them. But when you see a, a diagram, it, uh, it's, there's some context missing. I can't quite... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit confusing. Okay, and... and you and Dave are going to have a great time at uh, Eric's uh, farm on the discussion of that parameters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, we got no time for that. We got to put up a vertical. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, there's another, another, another question, actually. Uh, you mentioned that when you calibrated, like if you have 101 points, you you know, you at a 900 megahertz range, you get 9 megahertz spacing. So I'm just wondering, like I, I read somewhere that you have to calibrate this every time you change the frequency range. So do you really have to calibrate it? Because I, I don't know where the cables are. I never calibrate mine. I don't care about the numbers. I just look at the shape of the curve, like the SWR curve, look for a peak. So, how much difference do you think it makes if it's not calibrated? Well, I'm not an expert on this thing, but I I, I, un, I understand the point that if 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 you did a hundred if you did 900 megahertz range, then that would what the device will do it will interpolate between the calibration points. So that means you sort of it's some kind of average and it's not as accurate put it this way it's not as accurate as if you do your 400 points or your 100 points let's say on the 40 meter band which is 300 kilohertz right so you're going to get quite a number of calibration points in there so the spacing between the calibration points is going to be small so yeah. i think I, I i would i would i would calibrate it every time that's what i do is, is that you can just, calibrate it on. You can just calibrate it from one to one hundred kilohertz, whatever the lowest frequency is, to nine hundred megahertz, and use it that way. But I, you know, uh -huh. better. I don't know how accurate that is. You're, you're probably better to calibrate it properly, especially all the, all the stuff you read about this thing. They talk about this YouTube video videos about this. Like what this I I M S A I guy does talks about calibration he talks about using the device with an amplifier and uh, he says things like in the higher frequencies you got to it's 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 less accurate you got to be you got to be careful to make sure you do it properly with the higher frequencies because of calibration issues i guess yeah i've heard that above a gigahertz or so even touching like oil from your finger will totally screw up the the shape of the curve but <laughs> And let alone those, let alone setting the thing up on your desk and touching the cables, which drives well, me nuts. Yes, I know. Yeah, I'm I'm still trying to figure out at 30 megahertz, does it does it even matter? Or is it just the last decimal place of accuracy? Because uh, you know that that's 
I mean, yeah, their advice might be, they may be trying to position this as a scientific instrument. And so they want to get the best accuracy, but for, for antenna tuning and stuff, like, I don't know if it matters. It'd be interesting to figure that out. Maybe it doesn't matter, but you know, better be safe than sorry, I think, uh, as far as I'm concerned anyway. And, uh, well, I'd, <laughs> I'd rather be sorry than safe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. If, depends if depends what you're doing, I guess. Yeah, exactly. All right, thank you. The other thing, by the way, for what it's worth is it, it's uh, for the up to 300 megahertz, it uses the fundamental frequencies. And then it uses the third harmonic to get between 300 and I think it's five or 600. And then it uses the fifth harmonics, the fifth harmonic to get up to 900. Only, I, as my understanding, it's not actually harmonics. It's measuring the overtones or something, which are close to the harmonics. And I don't, I don't know. I don't, it's beyond my level of knowledge. But anyway, I don't, I don't have that issue because I'm not. But recording is on. I, I, I take the fifth. I don't know. <laughs> take the fifth. Like, like Donald Trump. It's, it's close, but maybe they are the same. But. I read somewhere they're not, but I don't know where. Anyway. Okay. okay. I just want to mention one more thing. Dave Kasner recently said that he, he, he the nano VNA, he wants a, a mode where it's used as an antenna analyzer and it just lets you select the ham bands and uh, uh, see the SWR. Because every time I use it, it doesn't save my config. I have to set up the whole thing all over again. Start, span, center, you know. It won't it won't save it why won't it save the configuration? I don't know. My my nano VNA is slightly busted. The touch screen doesn't work. Um if I save the config, I, well actually every time I switch hand bands, I have to change the center frequency and the span. I guess it I guess it doesn't help you stand on it and step on it or something. Is that what you did? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I it just came that way. <laughs> so I got a defective unit. I probably bought it from a cheapo place. But I I use the PC version, Nano VNA Saver, and it's perfectly fine. But again, there's no quick way to just choose the hand bands. You got to set it up manually. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. So, so someone should write the firmware to do that. There's a lot. Of, there's a you, you look at the uh, the Nano VNA. IO group and I have on my I have the daily summary coming to my phone every day and there's there's innumerable people who say things like how do I turn this thing on like there's a lot of even I know some of the stuff that they're asking they're, to me they're dumb questions I mean and there's a lot of that stuff that people don't they don't know what an antenna is so they ask questions irrelevant questions about how to measure this and how to measure that and you get these streams that just go threads that go on and on and on but um there's a lot of lack of knowledge out there and a lot of people out there who don't take the trouble to read what's out there like i've read the manuals i think i understand them for the most part and uh mm -hmm. but i don't know yeah anyway yeah well, i mean i have sympathy for people who encounter new equipment and in a totally new context and they need to get their bearings yeah so, that's right yeah so but, but, but yeah there are some basic you, you have to know what you need this instrument to, what you want to use it for otherwise learning like if, if if a person buys it doesn't even know what they need it for then of course they're gonna have a lot of trouble figuring anything out Dwayne, it looks like you had your hand up yeah a uh, couple of things uh I've had the Nano VNA. Actually, this is one of the first ones that came out, and I got it years ago. Uh, one of the things that really confuses an awful lot of people, especially when they started the I.O. group, a lot of the people that were in that at first, they, they were used to using the $5,000 and $20,000 uh, VNAs, and they tried to go and tell everybody that they had to do everything, you know, uh, the way they did with their instrument. They, there wasn't really a lot of simple instructions that came out with it. A lot of stuff, just really complicated things. Uh, for most things, you can go and set up uh, 
couple of different ham, you know, ranges under 30 meg that you're not going to have have to worry about too much. Do a couple of calibrations someplace in that range, and you can cover most of the things of having about having to uh, calibrate every time. Uh, you know, once you get up to a couple of 100 megahertz, things get to be a little bit different up there. You mentioned something about using uh, torque wrenches and stuff like that for cables, and you get up a couple get up four or five six hundred megahertz they can make a difference uh just how and just how you tighten up the cables will go and uh, cause uh, uh flood differences in readings uh and matter of fact on one of my blog posts back here a couple of years ago i designed a little uh 3d printed uh torque wrench for sma connectors there it's not really a calibrated torque wrench like they say but it gives you uh consistent <clears throat> consistent uh, uh tightness on all your connectors is really what you want is just consistency you don't really need the actual absolute accuracy as long as you're consistent your readings are going to pretty much stay resistant and for for Hassan, uh the easiest way to think about it is like like in your s parameters it's basically the first number is the port that's sending signal out on second number is the port that you're, you're receiving it on and yeah. you know, the other thing you mentioned on on harmonics it's not really just harmonics it's a square wave so you're basically everything is a odd number of harmonic that they're actually using in the uh, stuff okay al you had a question not so much a question, but well, first off, uh, Michael, excellent presentation. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I wanted to uh, second your recommendation of uh, dealing with RNL electronics. That's where I got mine uh, this past winter, uh, and through the cross border uh, uh, mm -hmm. shipping to get it brought in, it worked flawlessly. Uh, I, I bought the was the, the the light VNA four inch, uh, so it looks just like the one you got, but. Um, uh, I spent a couple of extra dollars figuring, well, things get obsolete uh, so fast. Might as well get the one I spent a couple extra dollars. So I think that current one is a, a thousand points uh, of scanning and uh, goes up to six gigahertz, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, 6.3 gigahertz, which mm -hmm. I'll, I'll never use that, but uh, I figured just uh, go for it. But I wanted to show one thing I, I picked up off of uh, Amazon, I think. I don't know whether you can see that. This is a, a bit of a training PC yeah, board. I know about those, yeah. Yeah, and it's got examples of bandpass, high pass, low pass filters, attenuation, everything you'd ever want. And I started playing with that. Well, I started playing around with the uh, the Nano, and uh, it, it gave you some good examples to uh, see what was really going on. So uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what I paid for this. It was probably 20 bucks or something like that. But uh, for what it's worth, uh, uh, I'd recommend it. The connector's a little hokey on it, but uh, uh, for what it is, uh, it helped me get my head wrapped around it. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking forward to using it a bit more. I, I really haven't... Uh, uh, done too much with it yet. I think one of the first things I did is I, I was winding an RF choke and I needed to know where the uh, self-resonant frequency was and it was uh, it, it was just great. I just plugged the thing in and uh, it came out on the graph. So uh, I'm really happy to have it. So uh, mm -hmm. thank you again. Uh, uh, there's so much more it does that I don't know what to, uh, where we're going to go with it, but uh, uh, if anybody uh, wants to do more demonstrations, I'm I'm all ears. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anyhow, thanks again, Michael. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, anybody else? Uh, oh, go ahead, Eric. Yeah, just a quick question. This may be a dumb one, but uh, most of mine are. Um, can the N a nano VNA be used uh, in the same fashion as a TDR? You know, like in other words, on a length of coax, finding the distance. Yes. Any... Yes, oh. you can. You can do that. You can. Uh, you can use it to find the length of a cable, for example. Yeah. Oh, okay. It, Which would tell you where the break is. That's right. It, it, oh, okay. it, what it does, it sends us. It you know, it sends the. It 
it sends a pulse. There's a, there's a pulse function in it uh, that you can set up, and it sends a pulse down the out the out the uh, port zero, the the one zero port, and it measures sends the pulse down and measures when it comes back, and then it calculates the length to whatever discontinuity is, be it an open circuit or a short circuit or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Did you mention that in your? Uh... I didn't. I mentioned something about length. I didn't get into it in, in detail. Al Wolke has a whole whole video on that stuff, by the way. And I'd recommend okay. anybody. <clears throat> it's worth it. Like this, he's got seventeen videos on this stuff, and I'd recommend people look at it. Just on the nano VNA. Just on the nano VNA. Yeah, yeah. And the one thing that I did, <clears throat> the last thing I did before putting this presentation together was that was the uh, the amplifier. Thing and I was very aware from the discussions with Peter and what and Dave about being careful not to fry your test instruments. So I put all kinds of attenuation. And but what what Al does is he normally you can, if you're just putting calibrating with a filter, you basically you take you got, supposing you got a couple of six inch cables you're going to connect to your filters. You calibrate it at the open sh short with the cable and the through and whatnot, and then. But with, when you're doing the amplifier, you've got to put this attenuator in. So what Al does is he puts the attenuator on the output of the VNA, so on the, the, the port that, with the generator. And he calibrates it on the outboard end of the attenuator. So you don't even have to subtract. When you do it that way, it's like the attenuator isn't there, and the display gives you the actual gain of the amplifier, the bandwidth, like it shows you. Uh, just like a just like a, a, a LT spice would show you a, a graph, same idea. But you don't even have you don't have to subtract anything because it's all taken care of with in the calibration. And I don't know whether you can. I'm not about to try it on my my spectrum analyzer. I don't think, but I, I presume you could do that kind of thing with an attenuator on the on a, on a spectrum analyzer as well and calibrate it somehow. So it wasn't, so you didn't have to subtract things, but I don't know. Anyway, Dave had a question, I think. Yeah, Dave. Yeah, um, I figured out my, I answered my own question. And uh, I suspect what you can do, okay, and you guys tell me if I'm right or wrong, since the nano VNA can't measure those S22 and S21 parameters, what you can do is if you take your device under test and flip it around. Exactly, that's right. It, then you're gonna get the measurements that the nano VNA gives you will be your S21 and S22 parameters. Is that correct? Well, that's right. If you, so that's if you, right. If you flip it around, like you put it, you put it one way, you're gonna get uh, S21 and S11. You flip it the other way, you're gonna be, you're looking at the right. back end. So that's exactly right, yeah, that's right. Okay, there's a so, couple of YouTube videos on people who have gone and made uh, relay switching boxes that you can set up to do that with. Oh, yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, uh, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, um, I have an old vintage one. I think Dwayne, I got mine uh, after Dwayne mentioned it at, <laughs> at a club meeting. And uh, when I purchased it, I think it only went up to like four or five or four or 500 megahertz. And then I upgraded the firmware, which gave us uh, 900 megahertz. And I wondered whether I whether that it's still accurate like that, or I should just stay stay within like the 400 megahertz level. I have no, to be truthful, I have no idea. I don't know. Okay. If you got the version that works at 900 meg, that should cover anything that you're looking at anyhow. So Dwayne, oh. uh, you you said you had a blog with that little uh, uh, wrench type thing for uh, a three D printed thing. Is that easy to find? Yeah, it's on my blog uh, kv4qb.blogspot.com. I'll post a link to that to that thing on the uh, reflector. That'd be great because I what I'll do I'm I'm, I'm going to get my brother to build one. My brother has a three D printer. I'll get him to make it for me. Okay. Okay. Uh, any more questions or comments? Yeah, one comment just for what it's worth. I yeah. I, uh, I fiddle around with this uh, this amplifier thing, and I sort of established I 
think I understand more or less what it's doing. So then I go back and you know try to set up my signal generator and to get the signal generator to show me the same kind of stuff and it's a nightmare. <laughs> it really is. I don't know. Should I should I put a 50 ohm impedance on the input of the output of the scope or should it be on the input of the amplifier? Who knows? Anyway, I, there's a lot to learn. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Ready. Okay. Um, up next, uh, Eric, you want to talk about your weekend? Okay, there. Unmute it. Um, so, um, yes, we have uh, one weekend at Eric's farm. I've got my notes here, but I'm going to have to put my glasses on to read this uh, properly. Um, this A week from this Friday, uh, the 26th uh, to the 28th of August, so Friday afternoon to Sunday afternoon, um, Michael has graciously rearranged his schedule and he is now going to be running a two-day workshop, hands-on workshop on the nano VNA. So thank you very much, Michael, uh, for that. I think you've whetted our appetites and uh, appreciate you making that sacrifice. So everybody bring your nano VNAs and uh, Michael will be there early in the morning Friday uh, setting uh, up the, uh, the, the, web, the, the, the workshop area. So. Unfortunately, I am unavailable. What? What? We just talked about this like at six o'clock tonight. Come on, Mike. All right. Anyway, just kidding. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, Mike will not be there because that actually probably would have been good. Um, I have a feeling that everybody should bring their nano VNAs. If, uh, bring them if you got them, I guess. Uh, um, because, uh, you know, maybe we could all learn something uh, um, you know, with them. Um, yeah, it's, it sounds like a good opportunity to do that now that everybody's kind of interested. So anyway, uh, seriously, the activities primarily will be centered around uh, raising a uh, vertical antenna on the property. I'm uh, slowly but surely getting all my little bits and pieces together to make sure that we have a successful uh, event there. Um, it's also kind of a bring your stuff to try out day. So bring whatever you want to bring. Bring stuff to test, bring stuff to take apart, uh, ask questions about. Um, uh, right now, um, the roll call has, uh, I guess, about uh, one, two, three, four, five definites. Uh, so it's uh, Peter, uh, POA, Ken, ABN, uh, Dave, OOI, uh, Al, IAW, who will be there, I believe, Saturday with uh, some things to sell. So if you haven't caught the thread on the groups.io, um, he's slimming his shack down. So uh, uh, bring, 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 bring your, uh, bring your heart in funds and uh, help Al convert some of his stuff into cash. Um, and uh, myself, of course, I'll be there. Uh, and a couple uh, maybes, Hassan uh, said he'll, uh, he's gonna try and be there. And uh, um, uh, Al, um, Al Haynes, ALH actually, maybe, maybe, I don't know. It's kind of funny, I was in at Radio World uh, uh, about four or five days ago or so, and I'm uh, sitting down there looking at the little cabinet of uh, demo units. I hear a voice, you know, to my side saying, Eric, is that you? And uh, well, lo and behold, it was Al. Uh, so we had a uh, uh, impromptu meeting and uh, ended up uh, spending more uh, than I expected after uh, Al kept prompting me to, to buy more, buy more. What so, are uh, <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, Radio, Radio World's going undergoing a major restocking uh, this week, but um, uh, what else? Um, yeah, that's that's most of the radio stuff that's going on this this uh, week from this weekend. Um, maybe a little bit of appliance disassembly, as I mentioned in the uh, posting. I want to try and yank out some transformers out of uh, uh, of some kitchen appliances and uh, household appliances. Put it that way. Um, maybe some high voltage caps and that. Uh, just so you know, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, there's actually a simultaneous event happening at the farm that weekend, um, uh, only a couple hours, but Saturday morning. Uh, so the farm, uh, we're part of a land trust, the Oak Ridges Marine uh, Land Trust. So uh, from uh, 10 a.m. till noon, they're having a, uh, what they're calling a mini bio blitz. So I think they're expecting 20, 30 people or so, but uh, there's gonna be volunteers and uh, experts there that are teaming up to try and identify uh, as many living things, I guess, all living things. So I guess they can 
maybe count, you know, hams as living things. And so, you know, prepare to be inventoried and maybe uh, examined. There may be some probing involved. Um, but uh, anyway, so yeah, they, they'll keep it anonymous. Don't worry. It's just a biological inventory. Of, you know, they, they just want it for their records for guiding future, I guess, uh, activities. So um, anyway, uh, so that's it. Uh, you know, if you're within range, uh, try and uh, try and make it and uh, mention it to others uh, you know uh, we don't have a a, a huge uh, number coming uh, there are you know spaces to uh, you know indoors and outdoors uh, whatever your your uh, fancy is to stay so we got a limited number of beds and cots and that kind of thing indoors but uh, there's there's always the bar and the coop um, you know the shed so lots of places Dibs on the chickens. <laughs> yeah, I heard Bob and Dwayne were going to come up. Eric, time. I was going to come until you talked about being probed. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, it's a little probing. Uh, it's never such a bad thing. You can learn some things about yourself you might not have known beforehand. So. But, uh, yeah, think. yeah, it's funny actually that you mentioned the chickens, Dave, because you know I've been closing up the coop at night, and you know they all seem to, you know, they have this very large nesting box uh, getting ready for it. it's about six feet long by about three feet wide, and there's this, there's, there's they're they're pecking this these initials into the thing D R. <laughs> you know what that means? <laughs> no, what uh, Eric? But but seriously, time. Uh, who's Friday, coming Friday, up when? Yeah, so Friday afternoon, um, you know, uh, time is uh, flexible. I'll be there all day. So, um, you know, any time after noon, I guess, on Friday is fine. So, uh, Like, Peter, what time are you showing up? Are you going, are you arriving there on Friday? Ken, what time you get well, there? Actually, I was hoping to be there early Friday, but it looks like I'm going to be either late Friday or early Saturday morning. My wife has an operation on Friday, on that Friday, if you can believe it. Oh. So <laughs> I, uh, I'm probably not going to get away as early as I thought I was going to. So I'll either be there late Friday or uh, early Saturday morning. It just depends. And I'll probably be there oh, probably late afternoon. I have to check here. I'm off. What Friday? No, uh, for the Friday, yeah. Mid to late afternoon. Just save a spot for my tent. Are you, uh, Eric? Are you there all day? Yeah, I'm there all day. So um, I'll send out yeah, the ag the address again, and uh, uh, we'll uh, have a brief discussion about food. But you know, it's nothing complicated, right? There's a barbecue there. And yeah, whatever. I might. I might come out early afternoon just to avoid the Friday traffic because, you know, it's going to be nuts on a Friday, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, no, by all means, anytime after, like, noon is, is plenty fine. So. Yeah, nothing on the schedule at all on the 26th. So. Uh, Hassan, are you bringing your 7,300? Yes, I plan to. And uh, I'll bring some, uh, since Eric's setting up his, his antenna, I've got the, the dielectric grease you need to use between the sections so we can grease up the antenna before we set it up. Grease up the pig. Hey, what about your, what about your microwave stuff, Hassan? Oh, yeah, I'll bring that too. Uh, uh, should I should I debug it, get it working before, or do you want to get it up working while we're there? No, well, debug it with uh, Eric. You, you, you might get him to grow some hair. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What's that you're holding up, Dave? Hassan, is it this stuff you're talking about? It's um, anti-ox grease? Yeah. It's not... Is that it? Yeah, anti-ox grease. Oxidation. Yeah. Well, you got some too? Yeah, I, I use an all my RF connectors. Would any dielectric Perfect. grease work? Yeah, I, um, automotive too. Yeah, like I have automotive I, stuff for trailer use. I don't. I don't know about using because I because electrician Peter would know probably about this that ad, anti ox grease is conductive. Like I, I think automotive grease. I don't think I think that's a dielectric, right? I'm not sure I'd use automotive. 
Well, well, I went to Radio World to try to buy some, and they said, just go to Home Depot and get it. So that's what I did. Yeah, that's where I got mine. Hassan, I got mine from a electrician, uh, electrical supply company, not from Home Depot. I went to like a, uh, you know, those electrical supply companies yeah. that the contractors go, go to. I went there and I asked them for it and they gave me a bottle. There's uh, stuff there. We used to, well, when I was active in the trade, we used to use that stuff on, on large aluminum conductors. You know, like uh, like the you know the big MCM sizes. You know the ones that are about that big in diameter. All all the aluminum conductors had that Nolux uh, grease put on them that's to prevent corrosion. Yeah. Oh, and the other thing that's useful is uh, the silicone Kapton tape. You use it to to seal the sections after you're done. That stuff is amazing. You just layer it on, and it never comes off. You have to cut it off with an exacto knife. Mm. But My yeah. Nice. My uh, my understanding is that uh, all the dielectric grease is conductive, no? Lunch lady told us. Uh, we have got any grease? Yes. Yes, we do. <laughs> Burn grease here, woman. <laughs> <laughs> Good one, Hassan. You guys, you guys are twisted. Man. You guys are... It's, 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 you guys put me to shame. You know? <laughs> What, you, you don't grease your poles before you put them up? Come on. <laughs> we'll definitely have to be hey, playing that on a continuous loop a, while we're uh, greasing the sections. Isn't this a family, <laughs> you know, channel? This is going to be a family. This is a PG, uh, PG uh, session, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not, Apparently, hey, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I upload these to YouTube, I specifically, I target all of them. I say none. Uh, they're not not for kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I, I have a question for Eric. Is, is part is part of the agenda a celebration for when you get your Canadian call? Oh boy. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that, that would be <laughs> and then Dave has to learn CW. This is going to be a great weekend. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm happy to show off my CW proficiency uh, that I've gained. Yeah, but, no, uh, show off, show off your Canadian call sign proficiency. Oh boy! <laughs> you know, I have to say something about Eric and his CW proficiency. He sent me uh, three pictures uh, a couple of weeks back, well, a few weeks ago now. And the first picture, and this was a him copying uh, copying Morse code over from, I guess, the W1AW. And the first picture, there might have been a partial word or two in it with a with a thousand letters. And then the next, and that was his first attempt. And then the next picture said one week later. And now I could there was what three or four words in there. And then the third picture showed what he had done that afternoon or the night before. And uh, there were several uh, words in there. So you're coming along quite uh, well there, uh, Eric. Keep it up. Yeah, get his call sign first, and then worry about CW. Uh, you just, you just yeah. quit deflecting. You, you start learning the CW now, buddy. P Peter, thank you That's for the okay. momentary. Uh, I will learn it. I will get. I got. Short. I got the Morse tutor. I got. I'll. I'll learn it, provided he gets his call sign. I'll learn five words a minute. Uh, he talked over you again, there. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm used to it. All right. So that's it. Thank you. All right, cool. All right, so uh, I don't know. Uh, that's pretty much what we have on the agenda. Does anybody want to discuss anything else, or? Yeah, I um, Al, I think when I, when I was uh, erecting my antenna, <laughs> you were you were advising me. You were talking to me about uh, uh, various metals and. Um, Stuff, right? You you've got a background in, in that, right? Mechanical engineering, but uh, oh, what do you need to know? Okay, I was wondering if I could uh, um, I'll put a bug in your if I could talk to you, not now, maybe tomorrow or sometime in the week. Sure. Uh, okay. You could you could carve out an hour, and you could talk to me about uh, the. The mast I got set up, I've got some concerns 
about uh, uh, mental fatigue, and I just wanted to to get someone who knows a little bit more than me to kind of guide me. Okay. So is there like, um, are you afternoons, mornings? What's what's good for you? Should, should I send you a message and we can kind of arrange a time? Yeah, send me a, either a, I don't know that you got my phone number, but you can send me a, a text message or or an email. And uh, uh, I'm still in at the office, so uh, evenings is better. Weekends are wide open. Okay, so um, so what I'll do is I'll go under reflector. I'll I'll get your email, and I don't want I don't want want you to uh, post your uh, phone number or your email on this because it's going to get posted on YouTube. Understood. And yeah, so what I'll do is I'll contact you via the reflector, the email on on the reflector, and um, we can coordinate a time. Sure. Yeah. No problem. I have no, no guarantee, but what I what little I know, I'll try to pass on to you. Yep. Alrighty. Okay, anybody else have anything? Okay, I guess not. Okay, uh, gentlemen, uh, have a good night. And uh, we'll see you in the beginning of next month. Thank you. Have a good yeah. one. Uh, Peter, uh, Peter, Dave, and Eric, uh, can you hang around for a sec? Yep. Sure. Good night, everyone. Thanks, guys. Good night. Okay. 73, thanks. Yeah, bye. Bye. bye.